China must prepare for war, according to Chinese leader Xi Jinping. And Indian and Chinese troops mass on a disputed border. That and more on this week's China News Headline. This is China Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. Chinese leader Xi Jinping has told troops to prepare for war. So I guess Xi Jinping is no longer going with the stronger international cooperation line anymore. Now to be fair, this is not the first time Xi has told troops to prepare for war. He does it every so often. This time, Xi Jinping didn't say specifically who the troops should prepare for war against, but he did say the purpose is to resolutely safeguard national sovereignty. I guess that could mean one of several countries. And that includes India. The border dispute between India and China seems to be heating up. China and India share one of the world's longest unmarked borders, called the Line of Actual Control, which is less like a formal border and more like a line of actual control. Indian and Chinese troops have clashed here several times already in just May. Both sides have tried to downplay the clashes, but satellite images may be telling a different story. Both sides appear to be bolstering their presence. An Australian security analyst posted these satellite pictures on Twitter last week. They appear to show both sides building more tents and roads within five kilometers of the line of actual control which separates the two armies. India and China once fought a serious war over their border. That was back in 1962. There was also a series of military clashes along the border in 1967. So could it happen again? Well, never fear, because President Donald Trump says he's ready to mediate the conflict. I assume world peace is now just around the corner. But just in case it isn't, the U.S. is selling $180 million worth of torpedoes to Taiwan. My favorite Chinese state-run media, The Global Times, is calling the torpedoes useless against the Chinese mainland military. And The Global Times raises a good point. Torpedoes are absolutely useless against troops stationed on land. That's some good thinking. Which is why I also suggest selling Taiwan nuclear weapons. Although the Chinese Communist Party would probably consider that the nuclear option. Speaking of selling things, the U.S. Commerce Department will add 33 Chinese firms and institutions to an economic blacklist for helping Beijing spy on its minority Uyghur population or because of ties to weapons of mass destruction and China's military. Wait, we shouldn't do business with companies that help the Chinese regime lock people up and grow a military that threatens U.S. allies? What a crazy idea. And on Wednesday, Congress passed a major Uyghur human rights bill. It would sanction Chinese officials responsible for detaining up to two million members of the ethnic minority in forced labor camps in Xinjiang. And on top of that, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has told Congress Hong Kong is no longer autonomous from China. Then there's Democratic Representative Brad Sherman of California. He wants to delist Chinese stocks, saying it's time for China to blink first. Well, it's clear that when it comes to China, the U.S. government now has its eyes wide open. But not everyone feels the same. For example, the Harvard professor who Oh, oh no, not, not the Harvard professor who was arrested for concealing Chinese funding. Another Harvard professor. One who says the U.S.-China rivalry is lose-lose. Probably should listen to him, right? I mean, Harvard professors are pretty smart. And all that money Harvard gets from China each year probably makes the professors even smarter. Over in the U.K., the broadcast regulator Ofcom has made a big ruling against Chinese state-run TV network CGTN. Ofcom ruled that CGTN breached UK media rules by providing biased coverage of the Hong Kong protests and broadcasting it to UK viewers. Apparently, the propaganda mouthpiece of the Chinese Communist Party gave disproportionate weight to the positions of government authorities in Hong Kong and China 
while not exploring the views or motivations of protesters. What do you mean they didn't explore the motivations of protesters? CGTN clearly showed that these radical protesters were there to manipulate chaos and collude with the foreign power. The UK is also apparently giving the axe to Chinese telecom Huawei. You know, when Prime Minister Boris Johnson got the coronavirus in April, who would have guessed that it would open his eyes to the Chinese Communist Party? At least that's one good side effect of the CCP virus. And in Canada, a court has ruled against Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou. Basically, that means instead of Meng going free, her extradition trial will continue. She was arrested in December 2018 and faces extradition to the U.S. for violating sanctions on Iran as the CFO of Huawei. In response, the Chinese Communist Party arrested two Canadian citizens, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver. They've been detained for more than a year, and not in a big house like Hmong. Their detention probably looks more like this. The Chinese Communist Party literally kidnapped two Canadians in retaliation for the arrest of a Chinese businesswoman. And they're still trying to threaten Canada into releasing her. An independent judiciary is not something the party understands. Uh, remember how the Chinese Communist Party built the African Union building in Ethiopia as a generous gift, but then it turned out they had bugged the whole place up and down? Well, according to this report by the Heritage Foundation, that wasn't a one-off. A lot of government buildings in Africa are probably being used for Chinese spying. At least 40 of Africa's 54 countries have a government building constructed by a Chinese company. Chinese companies have built, expanded, or renovated at least 24 presidential or prime minister residences or offices, at least 26 parliaments or parliamentary offices, at least 32 military or police installations, and at least 19 ministries of foreign affairs buildings. And Beijing almost certainly uses its engagements in Africa to surveil American and African officials and business leaders. Did I mention that the Chinese regime has been fighting a war against the world for a long time? Which is why I'm not surprised that a Chinese team recently scaled Mount Everest. They're probably trying to get as far away from that war as possible. And now, it's the time when I answer questions from you, my loyal 50 Cent Army, fans of the show who support what we do through the crowdfunding website Patreon. Zhou Rui asks, China Uncensored has been holding the CCP's feet to the fire for many years. Now that there appears to be hope that the CCP may be swept away to the ash heap of history, what are the plans for CU after the downfall? Have you dared to actually imagine this? Wow. I think the first thing I do is probably take a nap. A really long nap. I've been working pretty much nonstop on this show for eight years. But the next thing I do is maybe go to mainland China. There are many amazing things and wonderful people there. But of course, even in a post-CCP China, there's a lot of work to do. For example, sifting through all the internal documents that would come to light, just like after the collapse of the Soviet Union. There would be a period where the world has to really take stock of what the CCP was, what it did, and how we all played a part in helping it. And on top of all the China stuff, we do still have our other show, America Uncovered. And somehow, I don't imagine American politics ever becoming truly sane. But as for China, maybe after China is finally no longer censored, we could talk about all the good things in China and Chinese culture. I, for one, would really enjoy doing that. Thanks for your question, Joe. And for all of you watching, if you want to see a China without the CCP, consider joining the China Uncensored 50 Cent Army. You'll have a chance to ask me questions on the show, and there are some other cool perks as well. Check out patreon.com slash China Uncensored to learn more. And be sure to subscribe and check back every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday for new episodes, because YouTube isn't always sending out notifications about new episodes. How about that? Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.